The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All righty. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Drew English. I am the Program Coordinator and Client Experience Associate here at the Exit Planning Institute. Uh, today, I'm with um, John Warlow. He is the CEO of the Value Builder System. Uh, he is part of our Exit Solutions Alliance broadcast series, and he's going to be speaking to us today on the eight things that drive the value of a business. Uh, just a few uh, notes from me before I turn it over to John. Um, first off, the webinar is being recorded, so the recording of the webinar will be sent out um, after it concludes. So just look for an email from me uh, later today with that recording. Uh, secondly, uh, if you have any questions, which we uh, absolutely recommend, uh, there's a question box on the drop-down menu of your GoToWebinar panel. Just go ahead and type your question in there. Uh, that will alert me that there is a question, and then I'll facilitate those over to John at the end of the presentation. Um, so definitely take advantage of that if you can. Uh, and then lastly, before I turn it over to John, just a brief uh, introduction about him. Um, like I said, he is the CEO and founder of the Value Builder System. Uh, he's also the author of Built to Sell and the Automatic Customer. Uh, and before Value Builder, uh, John actually surveyed more than 10,000 business owners per year and showed major, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the world's most important companies, such as like uh, Google or Apple, um, how entrepreneurs think and, and, and buy. So um, I hope everyone can, can kind of listen to what John has to say today. And, um, you know, he's got, he's got a wealth of knowledge for us. So hopefully he'll be able to share that with us and, and we'll move forward. So uh, with that, John, I'll turn it over to you and we can get rock, rock and rolling today. Awesome. And what Drew didn't tell you is he's also a NASCAR fan and going down to some crazy NASCAR race in a couple of weeks. <laughs> got, some, uh, got some NASCAR credentials. Hey, listen, thanks for joining our webinar today. Uh, we're going to talk about eight things that drive the value of a company so that you as an exit planner can really have that knowledge uh, when you're working with your clients to know what levers you can help them address to drive up the value of their business. One of the things I'm going to do is share with you some data from our system. Uh, real life, we've had now 34,000 people use the system, and so I've analyzed that data so I can share with you the drivers. So I want to give you a little bit of background about us, how we work before we get into the data so that you've got a bit of context for the data you're looking at. Uh, so we'll start off with why we exist as a company, um, how we work with advisors. If you choose to join us, what you'd get as a an EPI member at a, at a SEPA grad. Uh, then we'll dig into the eight drivers. And then as Drew said, we'll do some questions at the end. First of all, why do we exist as a company? You've probably seen the Simon Sinek video, Start With Why. So let me just start with why. Our goal as a company is to level the playing field for business owners as they approach their exit. It's our view that Business owners are outnumbered. They're, it's like they're, they're bringing a knife to a gunfight when they come to an exit because on the other side of the negotiation table, they've got a corporate development executive or a private equity firm partner who buys companies all day long. And business owners are spending 10, 20, 30 years building a company and not really getting aware of how to exit one. And so we want to really right that wrong, fix that, give them the tools, the ammunition, the education to go about improving the value of their business and giving them a fighting chance at the negotiation table. Over the next 30 years, our goal is to help a million business owners with the value builder system. We've so far helped 34,000 business owners. And again, I'm going to share with you a little bit of the research that we've got from our user base. Just to give you a little sense of how we work, again, I'm going to share with you some data from the system. When when I say users, I'm referring to business owners who have gone through and completed the Value Builder questionnaire. It's about a 15-minute questionnaire. Um, takes, again, about 15 minutes to complete. And at the end, the business owner gets a score out of 100. And zero is bad, 100 is good, if you think of it that way. Our average score is 59. And we have done some analysis against our user base, and we've been able to statistically validate that improving your value builder score drives up two important outcomes for business owners. Number one, they're more likely to get an offer. And number two, the value of those offers increase in lockstep with their value builder score. Let me show you an example. So what I've got up on screen here is the percentage of our users, 34,000 users who have received an offer to buy their business. If we just look at the entire user base, again, the average score is 59, and about 12% of that user base 
has received a written offer to buy their business in the last 12 months. Now, if I bring up here in the orange bar, our users who have achieved a score of 80 to 90, these would be some of our better performers, they're about twice as likely to have received an offer. And if we look at in the blue bar, those that achieve a score of 90 or greater, they're almost three times more likely to have received an offer. So improving your value builder score for a business owner increases substantially the likelihood that they're going to get an offer. It also increases the likelihood that the business owner is going to be happy with the offer because the average user of value builder achieves a valuation because we ask the business owner on the questionnaire, have you received a written offer to buy your business? And if so, what multiple? The average user uh, achieves an offer of 3.6 times pre-tax profit. Yet again, if we isolate the cohort of our best performers, the folks who achieve a score of 80 or greater, they're getting offers that are 71% higher. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because the exit planners who use the value builder system merchandise these data points. They become the ammunition the EPI members and other advisors use to convince people to go through and complete the questionnaire and, and then invest the time to drive up their scores because it's going to... A, increase the likelihood that you're going to get an offer. B, increase the size of those offers and the likelihood that you're going to accept those offers. So it, these, you know, these really validate why we exist as a company. And again, to give you a sense of who we work with as a company, we work with business owners that have between 1 and 20 million in annual revenue. So if we look here at the green bars on my screen, you're looking at all businesses in the United States. And you know the way this works. 36% of the businesses, quote unquote, in air quotes, uh, you know, the U.S. Census Bureau says, says that are out there, 36% of them have less than $100,000 in revenue. You know, these are shell companies, they're self-employed individuals. These are not businesses that will ever need an exit plan. It's just 4% of businesses in the United States that crest the one to 10 million in annual revenue band. Yet if we overlay in orange bars here, our users, you can see that we way over index to the tune of tenfold more likely to find a business with between one and 20 million in annual revenue on our database than you would be in the market at large. So who's the value builder user? It tends to be business owners with between one and 20 million in annual revenue. And again, our goal is to help them improve their, uh, their options as they approach their exit. So that's a little bit about sort of why we exist as a company, how we work is we license the value builder system to exit planning professionals. Our goal is, is not, you know, when we sat down to think about like, how do we have the biggest impact on the business owner segment? Uh, we had a you know, critical decision to make in the early days. One was we could have gone direct to business owners and sold them consulting advice over the phone or, you know, through some sort of distributed model. Or we could go to the business owners trusted advisors. These are the people that business owners already know, like, and trust and license the platform to those individuals. And we decided to choose the second option. We licensed the value builder system to you know, experts in valuing and selling a business. So oftentimes that would be people who have the SEPA designation. They might also be a CVA or a CBI. Uh, they're excited to work with business owners in the one to 20 million in annual revenue space and, space and many of them oftentimes have at least two professionals working in their firm. And if you distilled all that down, the, the quantitative objective uh, you know, attributes we look for in an advisor and you kind of looked at it qualitatively, it comes down to are you an advisor whom a business owner would trust with their life? Because as you know, Business owners, for a lot of them, their company is their life. And so we look for and license the system to advisors uh, for whom uh, a business owner would trust with their life. So what do you get if you license the system? Again, I'm, I'm going through this data for you so that you can sort of contextualize what I'm about to show you, which is the eight key drivers of company value. I'm going to walk you through what we've seen in our data as to statistically linked to the, the improvement of uh, value in a company. But again, I want to give you the context of, of how this data is collected and who, who gets it for us. So what do you get if you choose to become a licensee of ours? Well, in essence, what you get is a system to help you work through EPI's value acceleration process. In particular, the discover section and the prepare area. Those are the two areas where the value builder system will really 
really help you uh, work with your clients. So in the Discover system, uh, area, we have a questionnaire, as I mentioned earlier, that a business owner can complete. It takes about 15 minutes to complete it, and they get a score at the end of that. Then they will have the opportunity to meet with you, their certified value builder, to walk them through an assessment of how they scored in the eight key drivers of company value. And the ultimate goal is that they get we get them over to our coaching platform, which is a structured 12-step process business owners go through to improve the value of their company. Again, when so I'll, I'll just drill down a little bit more into details of those three steps. The first step is a, the questionnaire. We give you an embed code that you can put in your website. We give you a link you can also use in social media, in your LinkedIn profile and so forth, that will allow a business owner to instantly complete the questionnaire, again, from your website or that, that magic link. When they do that, they're going to get their score out of 100, which gives them the, the kind of scratches that itch and sees how they are performing. What they don't get, though, are all of the reports that we generate that the software creates based on that questionnaire. Those are, are found within the Value Builder system, and only you have credentials and access to the Value Builder system. So you're in a position to decide how you want to uh, work with that business owner. Um, if it's a business owner you're excited to work with, perhaps you'd set up a face-to-face -face meeting and walk them through their value builder assessment. But again, it's, it's, you're in control of that process. We've got a number of reports in the system. There are five unique reports you can download from one co completed questionnaire. One of those reports includes an estimate of value. Another is the PowerPoint presentation that is the, the underpinnings or the platform associated with the value builder assessment. This is the meeting where you meet with the business owner and show them how they scored on the eight key drivers of company value. So for each of those drivers, and again, none of these would be a surprise to you given your credential as a, as a CEPA grad, you, you would know, you know things like recurring revenue, management team, growth performance, all these things are important. We show the business owner how they performed on each driver in the value builder assessment, as well as how they would go about improving their score on each driver. Each of their answers appears in red, the ideal answer appears in green so they can see how they would drive up their score. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is get them to the point of agreeing to be coached and to help in the prepare uh, you know, stage of, of, of process where they're being coached to improve their value over time. And as I mentioned, we've got a 12-step process to do that. It's a very structured process where each month there is a video series that the business owner watches. There's an online tool they complete, and then they meet with you as their advisor to give you, to, for you to give them some additional thoughts on what they should have taken away from the video, capture questions that they might have had in completing the exercise, and work with you throughout the year uh, to get them ready to, uh, to kind of go to market and prepare their business to, for an exit. Both you and the business owner would have login credentials uh, once they go through the once they go through and get you sign them up as a, as, a, as a client in the engagement process, both you and the business owner have access to the platform. And so what I've got on screen here is just a view of what the business owner sees when they log into Value Builder. You can see on the left hand side, each of the 12 structured modules are available in the navigation bar. When they click on any one of those modules, obviously it's one module per month of the calendar year. When they click on module one, they're greeted with the video tutorial series. So they're going to watch the videos that are associated with that module. So here I've clicked on module three, and you can see there's a four-part video series they need to go through in order to get to the exercise of that module. And then once they've watched the video series, they go ahead and complete the exercise in that module. They're doing all this, by the way, without you having to sort of walk them through it. They're doing it on their own time, at their own desk, etc. And then when you meet with them as your uh, sort of hour-long face-to-face or by screen share meeting, you walk them through, again, their reflections and questions, having watched the video series, completed the exercise, and then you update their monthly goals and the performance against their monthly goals that you've agreed to are important to them in driving up the value of their business. 
So that's the platform as it's structured. Now, regardless of what stage your client is at in that in that process, whether they've completed the questionnaire or or uh, uh, or they've gone through and, and done an assessment with you, you're likely to want to to nurture those clients over time because their appetite to do an exit plan or work with you is probably going to ebb and flow. You might meet with them and they might say, yeah, I'm thinking about an exit. Maybe I'll get that done in a couple of years or maybe I'm thinking of selling in three or five years from now. The question then for you as an exit planner is how do you keep in touch with them, right? Who has the time to create a blog or a, a newsletter when you're actually doing uh, your work? Well, we made that and automated that process for you. So you've got within Value Builder access to our nurture cycle so that you can switch it on and automatically be nurturing clients. We have content up to weekly you can send them that comes out under your brand. So you would see your company's logo at the top of each of the emails that go to your clients. Uh, each week, we've got either a podcast or an article, all with the same theme of driving company value. And again, it comes from you so that you can rest assured by clicking one button, you're nurturing that client. And then you can see that nurturing come to life within the Value Builder system. So here again, I've logged into Value Builder, what you can see on your screen, as a, an advisor, what you would see if you chose to license the platform. Now you can see what I've gone here is gone directly to a contact and clicked on Violet Carter, who's a hypothetical contact. You can see that Violet has completed her value builder score. She achieved a 58. But if I click on this word timeline, I'm going to be able to see all of Violet's interactions with me in chronological order. It's almost like a little mini CRM platform. So you can see all of the interactions Violet has had with the system in chronological order. You can see that we sent her her report and she opened it, for example. If we click down further in the timeline, we can go back further back to March 15th, she got her score. Back on March 8th, she clicked on one of those articles. And so you're, you can see what she's engaging with. You can evaluate how engaged she is with you and the system. And that gives you a sense of who is most likely to buy uh, the services that you're offering, obviously. Um, we earmark a set of activity points for each interaction that each of your contacts has with us. So for example, they might get five points for opening a nurture cycle email or 10 points for clicking on that email. So the more engaged they are, the more demonstrable behavior they have in the system, the more activity points they earn. And then when you as an advisor log in to Value Builder and you click on the dashboard, which is the first place you, you get to when you open and log in as an advisor, you're going to see all of your contacts stacked ranked by activity points. So you're going to see all of your contacts stack ranked by who's most active in the system. And that gives you a glimpse into who you should obviously go call. And you can query that and, and filter it by date range. So you can look at it like last seven days, last two months, lifetime, last 36 hours. You can query it by timeline so you know who to follow up with. In addition to the leads you're nurturing in Value Builder, we hope to, from time to time, send you a lead from the system. We invite business owners to complete the Value Builder questionnaire from ValueBuilder.com. But as I mentioned, we don't compete with you. We uh, provide all of those leads to the Value Builder advisors in our community. And we've made some significant uh, investments in marketing of late, and you can see that number of leads provided to our community of certified value builders just going up in lockstep. Back in December of last year, we were at 74 leads sent to uh, advisors on the platform. January of this year, 91. Last month, we sent 118. So that number is going up uh, nicely because of the additional investments we're making. One final thing I'll share with you before we get into the actual data, it's just a real life example of an exit planner who uses the Value Builder system. His name is Mark Tepper. Uh, he's based in Cleveland, Ohio. He runs a wealth management firm. And as a wealth management firm, they've also got an M&A practice uh, sort of bolted onto his firm. 
And Mark has a, a, a whole system he uses for building company value. But the first phase in his system is he calls uncreatively phase one. And in phase one, the business owner, it's the first sort of commercial relationship that Mark has with the business owner. He takes them through a valuation for the business and a financial plan for the firm, for the owner. And so what he's doing is trying to see if there's a gap, right? So if the business owner, if they go through and they realize the business owner needs, let's just say $4 million of investable assets to retire comfortably. And let's imagine that the after tax proceeds of selling that business are only $3 million as an example. Well, then there's obviously a gap of $1 million. And then Mark switches into phase two of his process, which is to improve the value of that business so that it does bridge that gap. Well, to do phase one, it includes again, the valuation for the company and the financial plan for the owner. The owner invests $10,000 with Mark. The question you might be asking is, well, how does he get clients? Well, what he does is approaches mastermind organizations. These would be Vistage groups, EO groups, YPO groups, and he offers himself as a speaker. And he says to the chair of those groups, look, I'll come in and I'll present to you a presentation on the eight key drivers of company value. The presentation, by the way, I'm about to walk you through in a moment. He presents that. Uh, at the end of that session, he then invites those clients to uh, uh, complete the value builder questionnaire. Once he gets that completed, he then walks them through the process. So again, he, he focuses on small mastermind groups, 10 to 20 people in each group. He invites them to complete the questionnaire before the session. And then those who have not yet done actually gets uh, at the session. He invites them to complete it. Um, then he presents the eight key drivers of company value. He then offers a 30 minute phone consultation with Mark, the the financial advisor, Chris, the M&A professional, and the business owner. He gets a 40% conversion rate on that offer. So if he's got 20 people in the room, he's getting eight phone calls set up. And then at the end of that phone call, he makes the offer for the phase one mandate. His conversion rate on the phase one mandate is 50%. So again, to do the math here, 20 people in the room, eight agree to the free phone call, four will agree to phase one mandate. We asked Mark recently to try to quantify what being a value builder advisor has done for his firm over the last 12 months. He said he's done 12 workshops. He charges $3,500 to speak. Uh, so that equates to about $40,000 of speaking revenue. He's done 48 phase one mandates. He's won 16 clients with an average assets under management of $5 million, meaning that's at, uh, about 800 grand worth of revenue to his firm. So he's able to directly attribute a significant revenue stream from being a value builder advisor. So I thought that might give you a little bit of context for what I'm about to show you, which is again, the data on what drives the value of a company. I thought I'd give you that context so you can see both where the business owners that complete the questionnaire are coming from. And when we talk about the data I'm about to show you, how it was it was it was analyzed and frankly how many people have gone through it again it's based on 34,000 businesses so the sample size is quite large if you're interested by the way in joining us and becoming a, a value builder advisor or learning a little bit about it you can head over to valuebuilder.com slash apply there's a form you can fill out there all right let's get into the data so what drives company value again when we ask that question to business owners, they answer in one of two ways. The most common answer is, well, the size of my company will predetermine the value, right? So a lot of business owners are under the, in our view, false impression that their primary determinant of the value of their company is going to come down to how big it is. Now, we see that that is important to the value of a company. What I'm showing you here is our user base broken out by company size. So again, I mentioned earlier that our overall average user, over 34,000 users now, their average user gets an offer of about 3.5 times pre-tax profit, right? That's the average. But what that fails to share really is how stratified the responses is by company size. So very small companies are getting less than three times pre-tax profit much larger companies with $10 million of revenue or more are getting more than five times pre-tax profit. So you can see that there is a, a linear relationship 
between company size and overall estimate of value. So on that measure, at least business owners are correct in assuming that size does impact their value somewhat. So that's correct, but I don't think it tells the whole story. When we look at industry, so whatever category or vertical the business owner happens to be in, that too will have an impact on the company's value. For example, manufacturing companies get much better offers than uh, administrative and support waste management companies, as an example, who are trading at less than two times pre-tax profit. Again, when I do presentations to business owners, what I hear is that those are the two most important drivers. They have the assumption that, well, because I'm a $5 million company, I'm gonna trade at four times EBITDA. Or because I'm a, whatever, uh, you know, a manufacturing company, I'm gonna trade at four and a half times EBITDA. That's their assumption. But what it doesn't really show, and what it doesn't really take into consideration is all the other factors that go beyond just industry and revenue that have a profound impact on the value of a business. How do we know that? Well, we just look at the data and we look at examples of the business owners we've seen through Value Builder who do either much better or much worse than the industry average multiple. Take for example, Jill. Jill owns a company called Ruby Receptionists. So she's in the business of helping you answer your telephones, right? So if you're a law firm and you, you're a one-man band and you want to give sort of a professional image, like you've got a receptionist, you would hire Jill's company, Ruby Receptionist. Now, Jill's built her company up to an $11 million top-line business. Now, she happens to find herself in that industry administrative support, which as I just showed you, on average, trades at about 1.8 times pre-tax profit. So let's imagine Jill's netting about 10% on her $11 million of revenue. So let's imagine she's got about a million bucks in pre-tax profit for her company. So according to the math, she should get an offer of around 2 million bucks. Jill recently sold her administrative support company doing $11 million in top line revenue for $38.8 million. So there's got to be something else. There's got to be some other attributes acquirers care about beyond just what size of company it is and what industry it is. And really, that's what we're going to spend our time on today. What attributes beyond just the size of the business that acquirers care about? The first thing they care about is recurring revenue. When we look at the data, again, life of the tool, average multiple around just north of three and a half times pre-tax profit. For those businesses that have achieved a score of 75% of their recurring revenue or more, meaning 75% of their revenue is coming from recurring sources, they're getting much better multiples. So recurring revenue has a profound impact on the value of your client's business. Now, one of the things that I think you might find is when you say the words recurring revenue or subscription model to a client, they're going to roll their eyes. Unless they're in the software industry or they maybe run a newspaper or a magazine, they're going to roll their eyes and say, well, that's nice. If I was a, a software company, I'd use a SaaS or software as a service you know, billing model, but, but I'm not a software company. I'm in the, whatever, fill in the blank. I'm in the manufacturing industry, or I'm in the distribution industry, or I'm in the retail industry. It doesn't apply to me. When I get that response, and I encourage you to use the same response, I tell them the story of H. Bloom, because H. Bloom was in the retail industry of selling flowers, and they saw an opportunity to remake the business of selling flowers into a subscription company. How did they do it? Well, they looked at who buys flowers on subscription, who buys flowers on a recurring basis, I should say. And they realized that hotels and spas and even wealth management practices often buy flowers because they want to give that sort of very professional image. And so these two guys, Sanyu Panda on the left and Brian Burkhardt on the right, decided to get into the business of selling flowers, but not in a traditional way where they're, you know, setting up a flower store and they're, you know, hawking flowers at Mother's Day and Valentine's Day. No, they decided to get into the business of selling flowers on subscription. At H. Bloom, you buy a subscription for flowers. And you buy them and, you, and they come delivered to your hotel or spa or wealth management company 
on a regular cadence. When I interviewed Son Yu Pan and I said, what is the benefit of having recurring revenue? He said, it's the predictable nature of the, the business model because he knows how many customers he has and he only buys the number of flowers that he has customers for. A typical flower store in America will throw out more than half of its inventory every single year. Why? Well, it's rotting in the fridge. After a month, the flowers are rotting. They've got to throw them out. Well, at H. Bloom, their spoilage rate is just 2%. It's under 2% compared to 50% for typical flower store. Why? Because it's predictable. And that's exactly why acquirers pay more for businesses with recurring revenue. And so, you know, what I, my experience would be is if you, if, if you tell business owners, well, you've got to have recurring revenue, oftentimes they'll say, I, I get that, but how am I supposed to do it? Tell them the H. Bloom story, because I think it, it shows you an example of the creativity required to create a subscription revenue in virtually any industry, even the retail industry, which is obviously not renowned for creating recurring revenue. But again, recurring revenue is going to be critical to the value of your client's business. The next attribute that drives the value of your client's business is called the monopoly control. You know, Warren Buffett a couple of weeks ago came out with his annual letter. And if you read his annual letter, you know, you've, you've heard him talk about a competitive moat, right? So the, the, the deeper and wider the competitive moat, the more differentiated the business is, the more valuable it will be, the more likely he is to invest in it. Why? Because it creates this sort of virtuous cycle, right? More competitive differentiation leads to more pricing authority, the ability to control pricing. When you can control pricing and get a bit better margin for your product, that gives you more money to invest in sales and marketing. The more money you've got to invest in sales and marketing, the more differentiated your product is. And it creates this little domino effect. And so again, we see that the companies with a differentiated market position, something unique in what they offer, they're not in a commodity game. They're not selling products by the ounce or pound. They're actually selling something that they're unique in delivering. They're getting much better offers. So again, life of the tool, 3.76, business owners that have completed the valuability questionnaire. Yet when we isolate just those business owners who said they have a virtual monopoly on the product or service that they sell, they're getting much better offers, much better offers. Which leads me to the story of Stephanie Breedlove. So Stephanie is a business owner who takes this concept of monopoly control to the nth degree, to the to the to its ultimate conclusion. Stephanie, uh, I'll tell you the story of her business because I think it's a fascinating story. She started more than 25 years ago now. She was a mom, a new mom, working at Anderson Consulting with her husband, and they had a child, and they wanted to have a nanny because they're a you know, double income family, both working professionals. They bought it, they, they hired a nanny and they wanted to pay that nanny legitimately above the board. And so they called a payroll service and they called ADP and they got the runner rent, right? She got her phone call sort of punted around four different departments at ADP. Why? Because nobody wanted to set up some lady from Texas and who wants to pay her nanny because ADP employees are, are spiffed on the size of the company they set up, right? So they want to set up, thousand, 10,000 employee companies. They don't want to set up some lady who wants to pay her nanny. It's, it's not worth their time. And so Breedlove got this terrible experience. And she went home to her husband at night and said, you wouldn't believe the experience I had in trying to get payroll set up for our nanny. And she had a light bulb moment and she realized that there was a business opportunity in creating a payroll company just to pay nannies. For parents who had busy lives who wanted to make one phone call to set up their payroll service. Well, she started Breed Love and Associates, her surname. She built the company up over a 25 year run. This is not a gazelle, this is not a fast growth company. 25 years, she built it up to $9 million in recurring revenue. She sold that company last year for $54 million. Again, for those of you who are valuation experts, you can look at those numbers and think, my gosh, that's incredible. How, how would you possibly get six times top line revenue for this company? Well, she did it by focusing on monopoly control. She did it by doing one thing better than anybody else. When she was early on in her company, she had a, a, a very critical decision to make. She reached a fork in the road. She was at $300,000 in revenue, tiny business, her and her one assistant. 
And her, her, you know, her most of the pundits, her advisors, everybody who was speaking on the speaking circuit was, was saying at the time, the best way to grow a company is to cross sell your existing customers additional services. And so she had one option to basically go to her parents who have these nannies and say, well, what else do busy parents need? Well, they need, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, they need, and nannies need, you know, they might need food delivery services. Maybe, maybe they need lawn care. They might need winter or snow removal services. All services that they need that she could have cross sold them to for which she was not differentiated. She would have been in a commodity business. The harder route would have been to go find more parents who have a nanny to pay. The route on which she had a point of differentiation, the area that she had monopoly control. Well, the moral of the story is she went the second route, the harder route, the more disciplined route. And she built her company up to differentiate on that one attribute. And that I think is the secret to creating a monopoly control business. So many of your clients probably are in the owner's trap. The owner's trap happens when you're selling way too many services to too few customers, right? Because the owner is the, the industry expert in their industry. It makes them very likely to sell lots of different products and services. When they're a, a, you know, a mile wide and an inch deep, they can't find employees to deliver because they don't have the same industry expertise. It means that customers become very dependent on the owner. We call this the owner's trap. And you know you're in the owner's trap as an owner when your business flat lines, you're, you kind of plateau. And the way out of the owner's trap is to do what, what Stephanie did. Most companies, when they get started, they sell lots of things to a few companies or a few you know, individuals that they're a business to consumer model. The most valuable businesses like Stephanie's sell just a few things to a lot of people. In Stephanie Breedlove's case, she just sold payroll for nannies. It's all they did. They avoided the temptation to start selling lots of other undifferentiated products and services. So when Care.com came along, which is an online venture-backed company that is basically the Angie's list of care providers. You go in, plug in your zip code, and it'll tell you care providers in your local market. Care.com had 7 million members. Stephanie Breedlove had just 10,000 customers. Breedlove went to care.com and said, look, you've got 7 million members. If we could, all of whom need to pay a caregiver pay payroll, have nannies, all of whom have nannies to pay. If we could convince just 1% of that 7 million base of users to use Breedlove, well, that's 70,000 customers. That's a business seven times the size that we are right now. Now let's imagine we could convince 2% or 5%. Well, you can see how that, company, Care.com, saw it in their hearts to spend $54 million to buy a $9 million company. There is more to the value of your client's business than what industry they're in and how much revenue they generate. Monopoly control is one of those big drivers. Another big driver is how satisfied your client's customers are. When an acquirer comes in to buy a business, what do they want to do? They want to de-risk that business, right? They want to make it so that that company is, is not risky for them to buy, that the revenue is going to continue and that the business is going to grow without the owner. Well, how do they measure that? Well, it leads a lot of owners to do some sort of customer satisfaction survey, which is the right idea, but oftentimes it's executed poorly. Because customer satisfaction surveys generally ask questions that have no predictive relationship with growth, meaning most customer satisfaction surveys don't actually predict the growth rate of the company. How do we know that? Well, a guy named Reicheld, Frederick Reicheld, came along and did the analysis. He was a Bain consultant. And what he looked at were all the customer satisfaction surveys large enterprise companies were using. These are companies like Southwest Airlines, Qantas Airlines, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, General Motors, Procter & Gamble. And they would ask all these questions on a survey of their customers. You know, how overall satisfied are you? Did we answer your call with one ring? If you had an issue, did we resolve it within one phone call? All the questions that you've seen or answered as a consumer. And what Reichelt realized was that none of them predict the growth rate of the company. The only question he discovered that had a highly predictive relationship with the growth rate of the company was what he called the net promoter score question. On a scale of, of one to 10, how likely are you to recommend this to a friend or colleague? 
It turns out that question is highly predictive of the future growth rate of the company. And that is why private equity companies and corporate buyers use net promoter score, right counts methodology, in order to evaluate potential acquisition candidates. When we look at the data, you can see here the average company of Reichel's work over a 20-year period grows at about the rate of the economy. People achieve a company to achieve a net promoter score of 50 or greater, which is what Reichel claims is world class, are the darlings of the economy. Apple, Google, Eventbrite, Harley Davidson. These are the companies that have continuously statistically got a 50% plus net promoter score. If you want to evaluate the your clients businesses on this net promoter score methodology you can simply survey a group of your clients companies customers whether they're consumer or businesses doesn't matter ask them the same question on a scale of zero to ten how likely are you to recommend this to a friend or colleague you then categorize or bucket those responses into one of three buckets you've got a proportion of promoters these are the guys who give you a nine or a ten give your client I should say a nine or a ten let's imagine this hypothetical example that's 25 percent you have a portion of passives. These are the folks who give your client a seven or an eight. Let's imagine there's 70% of those. And then you've got a group of detractors. These are the folks who give you your client a zero through six. To figure out your net promoter score, you're taking your percentage of promoters, in this case, 25%, and then you're subtracting your percentage of detractors, in this case, 5%, which leaves you with a net promoter score of 20%. Again, average across Reichel's work was 15, 1.5%. World class, people like Google, Apple, Amazon are getting 50, 5, 0. At Breedlove, they got 78%, consistently over 70%, almost unheard of, that promoter scores. How did they do it? Well, remember, at ADP, when you call a payroll service, they don't want your business, and they make that blatantly clear if you want to pay your nanny. At Breedlove & Associates, she staffed her best performing customer service people on the inbound intake calls. And when somebody calls who has a nanny to pay, they get the most incredible experience because that's all they do. Monopoly control, net promoter score, two big drivers of company value. And again, whether you're talking about big private equity groups, venture-backed funds, or corporate buyers, most of them use net promoter scores. Josh, as uh, Drew mentioned out of the gate in the beginning, I spent uh, 10 years running a company that worked and did market research for large enterprise organizations. And I can tell you that whether it's FedEx or Hertz or General Motors or IBM or Microsoft or Google or eBay or Apple, they all use net promoter score as a way to measure the satisfaction of their customer base. And by default, they use it when they go to evaluate a potential acquisition. It's an important way you can measure your company's, your client's business. Let's go on to number four on our list. It's called the Switzerland structure. And here we're talking about the company, the country of Switzerland. This, this attribute is, is sort of inspired by the country of Switzerland. And, and, and you've, you've heard about Switzerland, right? It's, it's kind of a punchline on a lot of jokes, right? Because they're, they're obsessed with independence. And you can look at their history, right? They didn't join either of the world wars. They didn't send troops to Iraq. They, they, uh, they don't use the Euro currency. Uh, they, don't, they didn't even join the United Nations until they had a countrywide referendum on whether or not to join the United Nations, if you can believe it. You know, they're that obsessed with independence. And, and, and your clients need to be just as obsessed with independence when it comes to the three legs of the stool that any business gets dependent on. Meaning most businesses become too dependent on a single customer, employee, or supplier. And that employee is often the owner. We ask the business owners that complete the questionnaire, tell us about your personal relationship with your clients. And, you know, is it, do you know each of them by first name or do you rarely get involved, for example, with ever dealing with a customer issue? Well, as you might imagine, the people who know their customer by first name have great deep customer relationships and poorly valued businesses. 
What you actually want is the inverse. You want a situation where the owner doesn't know, know their existing customers. So again, the data shows us that when it comes to the Switzerland structure, if you're too dependent on a single customer, supplier, or employee, and that employee can be the owner, the value of the business will be lessened. One of the other people that we have to be mindful of, or one of the other attributes, is a supplier. And I think most business owners get the fact that they can't be overly dependent on a single customer. They also get the fact they've got to work over time to become less dependent or less of a linchpin in their business. They often overlook the suppliers they use and how important supplier diversification is. Rick Day found that out the hard way. So Rick Day ran a company called Daycom Six and Systems. On the surface, you would have seen Daycom and said, wow, this is a great successful company. $26 million in revenue, installing phone systems for small and medium businesses. What you wouldn't have seen at a casual glance is how poorly Rick was performing on the Switzerland structure. The reason for that is they were increasingly investing, their, increasingly buying their supply, these phone systems, from one supplier, Avaya. They weren't spreading out their business with Cisco and Mitel and all the other providers of gear. They were becoming more and more dependent on Avaya to the tune of when, they went, when he went to sell his business, more than 90% of his supply was coming from Avaya. When he, got, when, when he went to acquirers and said, hey, would you like to buy this $26 million business? They said, well, we, we're interested, but what if Avaya goes bankrupt? You're out of business. What if Avaya changes its business model? And instead of going through resellers like you, decides to go direct, you're out of business. What if Avaya lengthens their payment terms from, or their you know, payment terms from you know, 60 days to cash on, 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 on order? That's gonna have a profound impact on your business, Rick. So when Rick went to sell his company, he only got four times EBITDA for it. But if you unpack, and I've just shared with you, a $26 million business should get at least five times EBITDA. But if you unpack the four times, you see an even, starker scenario play out. 40% of it was paid up front. 40% of it was on a three-year note at 3%. And 20% was on an at-risk earnout, meaning, meaning he wasn't guaranteed the last 20%. And so most people looking more scrut scrutinizing this deal would say it was really sold for 3.2 times pre-tax profit, which is a big discount over what is a typical average multiple for an industry average player. So again, the Switzerland structure, how dependent your company is on its owner, any customer or supplier is gonna drive the value of a company. The next driver is growth potential. So when an acquirer buys a business, they're gonna to wanna to know how does this business perform in the future? Most of your clients, the business owners who want to have their business valued, they're going to want it valued based on the history, right? They're going to want to say, oh, you know, last year we did three quarters of a million dollars in EBITDA. Or two years ago, we got the industry award for best customer service in our industry. They're going to want to look in the past. But remember, an acquirer looks at the future. For them, they're towing the start line of their marathon, right? So, so they're going to want to know, okay, you got this business up to $10 million in revenue. How do we get it to $100 million in revenue? And that's really when it comes to showing them the growth potential of this business. And again, we go back to the data. So we ask on the value builder questionnaire, how easy would it be for you to accommodate five times more demand? We ask that question as a proxy for growth potential. Average of the lifetime of the tool, 3.76. For those who said it would be impossible for us to scale that quickly, think of the law firm or the graphic design firm. We'd have to go hire five times more associates to accommodate 5x more demand. They're getting deeply discounted. Yet, if you look at folks who said it would be relatively easy, you could think of software company, manufacturing company by contrast, they're getting much better multiples. Scalability, showing a client how they're going to grow this business after you, the business owner, leaves, has a profound impact on the value of the company. And we know this by looking at different examples. Rod is another example we've seen through Value Builder. Uh, Rod, you may know, uh, you may know the name, you may know the face. Rod is the founder of Zero, the big accounting package that has had some, some big results of the last little while. 
Rod is also got the money to start uh, Value Builder or to start Zero based on growing a company called Aftermail. Aftermail was in the business of archiving mail, email essentially for large enterprise organizations. He built up uh, an, a, a, a essentially a proxy for or a, a, a charter or, or a, a demo of his product and he sold it to two charter customers. These are enterprise companies who need to archive their email. Uh, you know, Think of very large enterprise companies who for Sarbanes-Oxley reasons need to archive email. He sold two clients, million dollar contract each. Now, a lot of entrepreneurs would have done that and said, okay, well, we've got a $2 million business here. I've got two clients. There are another 598 Fortune 500 companies. Let me go sell the rest. But Rod didn't do that. Rod said, this is the perfect time for me to sell this company. And he went to a systems integrator, large, publicly traded Fortune 500 company, systems integrator, and said, look, you've got all Fortune 500 companies on your database. Why don't you buy Aftermath? You can go sell to the other 498 of your clients who need what we sell, and you can just buy the company. Well, he sold this little $2 million business for $35 million, 15 of which was paid in cash up front. Again, I reiterate, the value of your client's business does not simply come down to what industry they're in or what revenue they generate. There are examples, many of them, hopefully I've shared with you today, of companies that do much better, or in fact, like Rod, much worse, because they're not focused on the eight key drivers of company value. So again, what are the eight key drivers that go beyond just industry and revenue? Well, certainly industry and revenue will make an important difference, but so too importantly is recurring revenue. Focusing on selling less stuff to more people like Stephanie Breedlove and making that really disciplined decision on just selling payroll for nannies, getting a net promoter score up to 50%, first measuring it then and working to increase it, reducing your reliance on a single customer, employee, or supplier. And then finally, leaving some field left to plow, showing an owner, a new owner, a potential buyer, how they can go harvest a lot of the growth that you haven't uh, you know, monopolized all that growth that you can go out and continue to grow the business after the owner leaves. So that's the eight key drivers that I wanted to focus on today. And I was going to throw it over to you, Drew. I, I'm, I'm not sure if um, you've got any questions there over the, that have come in over the transom. I'm happy to take any questions in the time we've got remaining. It looks like we've got six or seven minutes for questions. So happy to take any questions that you've got. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, John. appreciate it. We actually had um, a, a few questions come in here. So uh, first question was um, business owners are obviously pretty busy. Uh, do you have a success rate or some kind of stat of how likely business owners will be uh, to complete online training and questionnaires uh, in a timely manner? So I can't tell you, I don't know the stat off the top of my head. What I can tell you is what works. Uh, what really works is getting business owners into a workshop environment. Uh, in a workshop environment, similar to the way Mark Tepper does it, you've got a captive audience. So you can invite business owners when they register for your workshop to complete the value builder questionnaire. Then you're at the workshop. You can take a break and say, hey, if you haven't completed it yet, fire up a web browser and complete it now. And then after the webinar or after the workshop, if you still haven't gotten them to complete the questionnaire, you can invite them to do it again in your post comments uh, associated with completing the, the workshop. We've also seen a lot of our advisors actually walk through the questionnaire in real time in a workshop setting. So, for example, we have a, a guy named uh, Steve Sutton in South Africa who is one of our most prolific advisors. He'll run you know, uh, dr uh, webinars and workshops on the drivers of company value, and he'll literally put up a, a picture of each of the questions, there are about 32 questions, he'll put up the question on a PowerPoint slide in the room, and then he'll have each business owner answer a paper-based version of the questionnaire in front of them, and then he'll hand all those paper-based questionnaires to an assistant, and he'll have that assistant complete the online questionnaires. So workshops, 
using analog paper and pen or digitally can be a, a really effective way to get business owners to complete the questionnaire. As I mentioned in my earlier comments, we also give you a unique vanity URL that you can include in your social media. You can email it to people. Um, you can email it even to centers of influence like accountants that you work with that you want to have them invite their clients to complete the questionnaire. Um, so those are some of the most effective ways. But, but again, uh, workshops we have seen to be the most effective way to get business owners to complete the questionnaire. Perfect, perfect. Uh, second question, uh, when business owners go online uh, to use the value builder system, will uh, my logo be seen by the client as well as the business owner uh, on the dashboard? Yes. So when you load your logo, when we set you up to use the system, you load your logo into the system. And so when they log in, when your client logs into Value Builder, they don't see our logo, they see your logo. So there's a section uh, where it says, you know, your Value Builder advisor, and it, it includes your name, your email address, your phone number, and the logo of your company. So they see it. And also, we give you an embed code to, to embed in your website the intake questionnaire. So again, they never leave your website when they complete the questionnaire. They still see your logo, you're, they're in your website when they're completing the questionnaire. Uh, but again, when, they, when the business owner, when the client logs into Value Builder, they're seeing your, your logo behind the paywall. Perfect, perfect. Uh, next question, um, how much does the Value Builder system cost? It varies a little bit on how you want to use it. So we have two license types. Um, we have a pro license and a total license. A pro is for, for business advisors uh, who really want to use the questionnaire and the corresponding report, almost like a business development tool. They, they've got their own way to monetize it. Maybe they're a wealth management firm, or, and they want to just use it for sort of a, a marketing tool. That's all called our pro license. And then we have our total license, for people who want to do the coaching, who want to you know to use value uh, to use EPI vernacular, they want to help them through the, the prepare gate. Uh, for those folks, uh, you're going to need our total license, and then we price the, the the pro license and total license differently, and it depends on how many users in your firm. Uh, so the best thing to do, I think, is if you're interested, hop over to valuebuilder.com/apply. Drop your email address in there, and then we'll get you we'll get you sorted out with somebody who can walk you through, learn a little bit about your firm and who's going to use it, and, and in what capacity, and get you a custom quote for uh, for how much it'll cost your firm to integrate. Perfect. Just a few more questions here for you, John. Um, have you found that the Value Builder platform to be effective for companies over twenty million in revenue? We have some advisors who use it with companies that are larger, um, but it is not it is not our focus. What we found for companies that are over twenty million in annual revenue, frankly, they've got some senior talent at the table already. They're likely to have a chief financial officer or at least a director of finance at that level. They've probably got a private equity company investor at the table or a silent investor, in which case the, the representative from that private equity group is a very seasoned executive uh, and, and is going to bring some senior level chops and some strategic talent to the table. And so they're, the business owners that have between 20 and 100 million in revenue, for example, they've already got some, frankly, oftentimes free <laughs> or embedded uh, you know, senior strategic talent around the table. So while Value Builder can work with those companies, our focus is really not serving those companies. We're really focused on, on serving those businesses between one and 20 million in annual revenue. Um, it's the business owner, they're making the decisions themselves and, and they know everything there is to know about making a widget uh, but nothing really about what the value of their company is and how to make it more valuable. Perfect. And then we'll uh, we'll conclude with this, this last question here. Um, have you ever had lawyers subscribe to the Value Builders program? And kind of building off that, um, kind of what common characteristics characteristics do you see from advisors that license your uh, Value Builder system? Uh, we've got lots of lawyers actually who license the the system. A any lawyer who does uh, business work works with business owners, wants to differentiate themselves uh, by doing succession planning or estate planning. Those are those are very common uh, advisors for us. Or any M and A lawyers are also very common advisors for us. Uh, really, it comes down to that question. Uh, 
does a business owner trust you with their life? So we look for people who have uh, you know, real uh, trusting relationships with business owners. Uh, so oftentimes they've got pr professional credentials. They're a, uh, they're a wealth planner and they've got their CFP uh, or their, or their, they've got their SEPA designation is another big one we look for, a uh, CBI designation, uh, or they're a CA, a chartered uh, accountant. So we're, we're really looking for, you know, professionals, people who business owners would trust to take them through what is oftentimes one of the most you know, critical elements of their business, this kind of the strategic end game. So that's what we look like. And, and it's sort of a common denominator among the advisors we work with. Perfect, perfect. Well, John, thank you so much for uh, for spending about an hour with us today and, and kind of going through the value builder system and, and then answering those questions. Um, to the attendees online still, if you have any other additional questions, uh, please either email myself um, or you could email John directly. One of us would be more than happy to, to kind of get those questions answered for you. Uh, but the, just to remind people, um, again, I'll be sending out the recording uh once this webinar concludes and it downloads, I'll send that to you guys via email. So just look for an email from me later today. Uh, but with that, we'll get everyone back into their busy, busy day and busy week. Uh, John, thank you very much again. Appreciate you spending some time with us and going through this. And I hope Pleasure, everyone has a, thank you. Thank you very much, and hope everyone has a good rest of the day and a good rest of the week. And we'll uh, we'll talk soon. Talk soon. Thanks for for having me. Right, bye bye.